So let's let's um, let's transition over to GPAC, and let me let me kind of set it up. I mean, I've I know FFmpeg. You know, it's it's really good on the encoding transcoding side. A little bit less good on the packaging side. Um, we use GStreamer as kind of a workaround for some of the bottlenecks that we, you know, that I described a few minutes ago that worked pretty well. And then, you know, everybody, you know, I've known you for years and known about GPAC for years, but you really came to prominence when Netflix licensed the technology for their live streams. Give me, give me an overview of, you know, just really high level about where you see those three projects, including, you know, FFmpeg, um, GStreamer and GPAC, you know, what they do, how they fit in together, uh, what they're good at, what they're not so good at. FFmpeg, as I said, they are the libraries and these people are implementing codex protocols. It's a, it's a really nice toolbox that is really, really complete. There is a, there's been a huge effort on it. Um, really successful project. I would say critical infrastructure for the industry today. Uh, and then there is the FFmpeg application uh, that people use. People like it because the the interface is uh, quite stable. You can reuse a lot of your common lines from from years ago, and they still work. Which is not the case at the you know library level where you have to you, you know you have to implement uh, the API, which is the interface uh, at the coding level, and it changes from time to time. So that's more work to go on the libraries. You can get some of the benefits. Uh, for most people, you can use the FFmpeg common line libraries. Um, GPAC, um, so we're also implementing um, some, um, um, some standards and some um, you know, streaming protocols. So we're really experts on this, demuxing, muxing, uh, packaging, uh, encrypting, streaming. We are active at standardization. So we have a lot of R&D. That's the difference, for example, with uh, FFmpeg. And inside GPAC, we have our own code, and we integrate it with other libraries. And FFmpeg is a big one for us. It's a big dependency, and uh, you know we leverage a lot of FFmpeg for you know our customers, our users in general. GStreamer is more like an aggregator. There is no real uh, code being implemented in FFmpeg, even though it it has changed over time, but uh, its ambition is to, you know, aggregate everything into, you know, this kind of what they call elements, which are kind of modules that you connect together in a big graph. So GStreamer is really good at this. You mentioned that uh, GStreamer, uh, you know, could handle some of the bottlenecks that you had with FFmpeg. Uh, the framework is really more complex. And for example, we were talking about saturating the memory. Uh, GStreamer has nice mechanisms for, for this. For it pre-allocates the buffers. It never allocates on the fly, which is also something that you know FFmpeg or GPAC uh, do. But with GStreamer, when you have a queue, a buffer, when you are high in a buffer or low in a buffer, it's going to emit a message. And so I was talking about the scheduler. You know, this is something that is important at the GStreamer level. They can decide to execute or to not execute some of their elements just because the buffer level is high or not high. And so you avoid saturating, for example, your you know, memory usage or whatever, because when a buffer is full, there is nobody that's able to push data to you, for example. So that's a really a precise example of where a GStreamer may have better uh, performances. A GPAC is also quite uh, you know, flexible and we have all kind of, I think, intelligent uh, mechanisms to try to handle uh, performances in the best way, but again, you know, it's uh, it's magic by default. There is a lot of automation, and if you don't like it, you can disable it. And there is a lot of flags to uh, try to control your performances, depending on you know the whole environment. GPAC may not be aware of. It's not like when you run these tools, there is no like uh, something that is benchmarking your system and then says, okay, the best flags for you are this or this. It's just saying, how many CPU cores do I have? Or how much memory do I have? And it doesn't consider the fact that you're running a browser at the same time, you know, using already a lot of memory or, you know, other considerations. 